How wonderful person, this is Anton, and today, once again, we're going to be discussing the third confirmed interstellar comet, 3i Atlas. A real-life cosmic visitor from another star system, carrying all sorts of mysterious secrets with it. But, well, if you've seen the movie Don't Look Up, and honestly, I guess, who hasn't at this point? You probably remember the central premise. There's a massive extinction-level comet that's headed toward the planet, and absolutely nobody in the media or the public cares. That's why it was called Don't Look Up. Everyone is too busy looking at, well, everything, except for the massive rock that's about to end civilization. And when Comet 3i Atlas showed up, I thought that, well, here we go. We finally have an opportunity to, I guess, prove those Hollywood writers incorrect, because we're going to be super rational, we're going to look up and focus on actual verifiable science that's going to tell us a little bit more about the galaxy and make us just a little bit smarter. Um, yeah. So that hasn't actually happened. And though we are looking up, which is of course the good news and something we're going to be discussing today, the bad news is that the public dialogue so far is a little bit disturbing. Here the public dialogue is stuck in a kind of a perpetual loop. Resembling a poorly written sequel to Don't Look Up, unless it's alien tech. And that's because of one single person from Harvard who uh, a lot of scientists are really upset with, and because of one controversial paper, poorly written paper by the way, that decided to hypothetically ask, well what if this is an alien tech because of all of this metal emitted from it, such as nickel. Uh, we'll discuss this in a few minutes. Suddenly, the only thing anyone wants to talk about is whether this giant dusty space snowball is actually a flying saucer piloted by some kind of a weird civilization trying to communicate with us. But if you're here for that, uh, sorry, we're not going to be discussing this. Because today we're going to be discussing the actual science and all kinds of reports showing the extreme nickel to iron ratio, the unusual observations in regards to water emissions, and some other really cool scientific stuff that tells us so much more about this comet and the galaxy, and not really about aliens or whether they even exist. So today we're going to focus on science once again, because the comet has once again been captured by another spacecraft, and we now have even more data. Let's dive into the real science of 3i Atlas. And as always, all of the studies I'm going to be mentioning today, and all the previous studies we discussed, should all be in the description below. But in case you're bored with the video and just want to move on, but one day would like to find out more about the comet and actual science behind all of this, here's how I do it when preparing for these videos. I go to a website called Archive. This is a free to use website that contains all of the initial drafts for all of the studies in astronomy and astrophysics and is run by Cornell University. Here, by typing 3i Atlas in the search box, you basically get pretty much all of the major studies about this, which you can then read to your content. But if you don't want to read them, I mean, this is what this video is for. And so, following this super long intro, let's talk about the comet. Discovered relatively recently, in July of 2025, and almost instantly confirmed to be an interstellar object because of its very stretched hyperbolic trajectory. Or basically because it was moving so fast across the solar system that there is just no way to explain this unless it came from somewhere far away. The initial velocity was 58 km per second, but it obviously has already increased by now because it's approaching the sun. But the reason this became so exciting for astronomers, and actually a lot of other scientists, is because of its very unusual composition and extremely unusual activity that forced scientists to start rethinking about what we know about comets around other stars. And so in the last month or so, as the comet approached the sun a little bit closer, and as it actually approached Mars, we've now collected even more data, but also answered some really important questions. But I guess first let's recap what we know so far from some of the previous discoveries in the last two months. First, we know for sure that this is an active comet. And it's a comet consistent of solid icy nucleus surrounded by a fuzzy cloud of gas. And so it actually does look like a typical comet we observe in the solar system. But the nucleus is potentially a little bit smaller than we initially thought, maybe about 5.6 kilometers wide or even smaller. Initially this was thought to be much larger at 20 kilometers, but the observations from the Hubble Space Telescope corrected some of these initial assumptions. It's also believed to be pretty old, possibly over 7.6 billion years old in age, because it seems to have come from the location in the galaxy that contains a lot of ancient stars. Which may explain why its chemistry and its composition is just different from what we have here. And in terms of composition, some of the early observations from the James Webb Space Telescope confirm that this comet is incredibly enriched in carbon dioxide. And especially enriched in CO2 compared to water. And for the solar system this would be super weird. 
We don't really have comets that are so enriched in CO2 and so depleted in water. Currently, the ratio is the highest we've seen in any comet, making this a somewhat exceptional object. But for scientists, this is also a really important hint. The hint in regards to the formation of this object. It very likely formed in a very cold environment, where CO2 can condense pretty easily, and very likely got kicked out from the outskirts of its star system, carrying all of this pristine material for billions of years. With the same observations also discovering a lot of other stuff we usually observe in comets, including ions of cyanide, carbonyl sulfides, and carbon monoxides. None of these are strange. A lot of comets in the solar system contain them as well. And so here it was really that water mystery at first that was a little bit strange. And we now potentially have one of the solutions. Because recent discoveries did actually finally find water, but in a very strange way. In a study published in late September, scientists using the NASA SWIFT observatory detected the first clear evidence of water molecules. But they could not see water directly. Instead, they discovered what's known as hydroxyl gas. Hydroxyl is a leftover when sunlight breaks down water molecules in outer space. And there was a lot of it as well. And this was a major discovery and a major technical achievement. Now, normally from Earth, we cannot actually see this because this can only be visible with the ultraviolet detections and the UV light is blocked by the atmosphere. And so ground-based telescopes cannot see this. But the SWIFT telescope could. It's a space telescope, so it was able to detect the signal pretty easily. But the mystery was in regards to when this was detected. It was actually seen back in July of 2025, when the comet was at least three astronomical units away from the Sun. And we don't expect water to evaporate at this distance from any cometary object. Water usually starts to evaporate much closer. Yet here, researchers confirmed that the water was escaping the comet super fast. 40 kilograms per second. Here, scientists even compared this to basically a fire hose running at full blast. And so the explanation now suggests that all of this water was not coming from the direct sublimation, but was actually part of much smaller ice-coated dust grains that were ejected into space and contained water on the surface. And the water was then broken down by the sunlight, producing all of the hydroxyls. And so the water vapor was not released directly from the comet, but from the escaping dust instead. And this is a really important discovery and a very important benchmark for comparison because we obviously have two other interstellar comets to compare this with. The first comet, Oumuamua, was completely dry. It contained no water. Comet Borisov was rich in carbon monoxide, but the water was not a significant discovery. Yet here we have a surprising amount of water, but at an unexpected distance. In essence showing us how diverse the building blocks of comets across the galaxy seem to be. All three of them seem to be almost entirely different. And that's once again not really what we expect because we always thought that maybe comets were kind of similar to what we have in the solar system, as we expect all of these star systems, to form in a very similar way. It looks like maybe that was a premature assumption. Then we have our metal discoveries. And that of course created a lot of buzz in the press because detection of nickel coming from the comet somehow convinced the press to think that maybe this was the spaceship made out of metal after all. But the reality is that there are dozens and dozens of cometary studies that always find iron and nickel in pretty much most of the comets in the solar system. As a matter of fact, many comets we observe pretty much every year seem to contain at least some of these metals. And we are pretty certain none of them are aliens. Nevertheless, there was a bizarre mystery here as well. Mostly because in the solar system, the ratio of nickel to iron is usually very specific, but is also about 10 times higher than the ratio discovered in the Sun. So essentially we see these metallic particles, but we're not entirely certain why the ratio is so different. And so some of the recent observations from the Very Large Telescope tracked the comet between August and September and confirmed the discovery of nickel emitted from this comet as well. But at first they didn't really see any iron. And that was of course a big mystery because why not? We actually always expect iron and nickel to kind of come hand in hand. And so this lack of iron was somewhat difficult to explain. But it did appear just a little bit later. Once the comet was closer to the sun, about 2.6 astronomical units away, we suddenly started seeing signs of iron as well. And you can kind of see the evolution of the spectra in this image. Here nickel, which is solid blue, and iron, which is visible in red, dramatically changing its emissions over time. 
And so this extremely high nickel to iron ratio dropped extremely fast as the comet got closer to the sun. And though the iron nickel emissions resemble the typical solar system comet, this unusual rapid change is something new and something that's never been seen before. But it does provide support for at least one potential explanation when it comes to comets. The theory of metal release. And specifically that these metals are contained in a highly volatile organometallic compounds, specifically nickel tetracarbonyl and iron pentacarbonyl. So they're not just pure nickel and pure iron, they're actually organic compounds. And so in this case, nickel tetracarbonyl has a lower sublimation temperature, and so it starts to emit much faster, whereas the iron molecules vaporize much closer to the sun and thus are usually invisible farther away. And so here this comet provided us with at least some evidence, or at least some explanations, for why we seem to see iron and nickel emitted from comets even right here in the solar system. They're essentially just part of a very specific organic compound. But additionally, on October 3rd, as the comet made its closest approach to Mars, and it was only about 30 million kilometers away from Mars, the European Space Agency used one of its orbiters, ExoMars, to try to snap a picture of the comet as it moved across the night skies. And that's what you're seeing right here. And when it comes to the orbit, here's roughly when this happened. So as you can see, Mars and the comet were pretty close to one another. And so here, 3i Atlas is seen as a fuzzy bright dot representing the comet's icy nucleus, surrounded by a coma thousands of kilometers wide. But as you can see, the images are not particularly exciting because these observations were sort of challenging. This comet is about 10,000 to even 100,000 times fainter than the Martian surface. And this particular probe, or this orbiter, is not meant for these types of pictures. And so because of the distance and the faintness, the orbiter was unable to distinguish the nucleus from coma or even capture the tail. Mostly because they were designed to look at Mars and the Martian surface, not really the comet. But looking ahead, as the comet travels across the solar system, there are maybe two other deep space missions that could maybe observe it again. Since this comet's trajectory aligns with the ecliptic plane, the Europa Clipper and ESA's Hera spacecraft may potentially pass directly through the comet's ion tail in the next few weeks. So here we're talking about November 2025. And while they're going to be millions of kilometers away from the cometary core, by crossing the tail itself, it would allow Europa Clipper, which has a plasma instrument and a magnetometer, to potentially detect signatures like the magnetic field, or to pick up ions from the interstellar object for the very first time ever. In other words, there's a very high chance we might get some data from this particular mission, even though, once again, it was never designed to look at comets. Likewise, the European Space Agency's JUICE mission, or Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is now scheduled to observe this object on November 2025 as well. And at this point, because the comet is going to be very close to the sun, it's expected to be very active. And so the spacecraft is going to observe the comet with every single instrument it has. But we're not going to get the data until early 2026, because this spacecraft is also going to be behind the sun. So we're essentially just not going to see it for some time. And as I mentioned in previous videos, for the next few months it's just going to be invisible to us because of its position behind the sun from the perspective of planet Earth. Even based on the data so far, this is already one of the most exciting objects in the solar system. And it already started to rewrite certain understanding we have about comets and other star systems. Once again, for example, the detection of the water vapor at such great distances currently challenges traditional understanding of cometary activity and even suggests that sometimes tiny ice-coated grains can form much farther away from the sun than we expected, producing very bizarre tails surrounded by water particles. Furthermore, the dramatic change of nickel to iron ratio supports the idea behind the volatile organometallic compounds that many of these comets, even the ones in the solar system, seem to be made out of. And so many heavy metals we observe in cometary tails seem to be produced the same way. And so the ultimate importance of this comet and the observations right now are really all in regards to the composition. It offers us an extremely rare opportunity to study the chemistry and physics of different star systems and try to understand stellar formation by observing these pristine materials. And though right now there are still quite a lot of unanswered questions, I think by now it should be pretty clear that none of them should be about whether this is some kind of an extraterrestrial probe or if there are any aliens on board. And that's because there is literally 
zero observational evidence that something bizarre is going on, except for that unusual chemistry I mentioned in the video. But we'll obviously come back and discuss this more very soon, because I'm sure there are going to be additional studies and even more observations, and especially after November 2025. And so until then, check out previous videos in the description, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM it directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access. You can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.